Alice Flanders, thank you for joining us at Woodside Community TV, running for Senate. Why don't we start off by just giving us a little background about yourself. Who are you and how did you come to be a candidate for Vermont Senate? Wow, okay. So I'll try to make it to the point. I'm not from Vermont. That is not originally from Vermont. I was born into a military family. My father was in the Air Force. He actually was a radioman and uh, flew in planes. Um, I, was I was almost born in Springfield, Massachusetts, but my mother wanted to have me born in New Orleans, where she grew up, not where she was born, where she grew up. And so I had, I was born in a military hospital in New Orleans. And I, my, younger, my younger brother, who was one year younger, was also born in New, or New Orleans. Our family was very, very keen on education. In fact, growing up at that time, I was born during the time and I was alive, a little girl, when Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated. Education was very important to them. So much so that they were willing to sacrifice to make certain that we went to whichever school we wanted to go to. I chose an all-girls school and uh, that wasn't far from where I lived. We were so poor that I remember times when for lunch, I had sardine sandwiches. And I didn't think anything of them because that's not what I was about. I also worked very hard in school and even though the teachers weren't expecting so much because they'd never seen so many people of my color come through uh, that private school and they tracked us. So I was in the A track, whatever that was really called. They didn't expect that I would succeed. I always knew that I was going to succeed. So even when I was in high school, I wanted to be able to answer, who knows how to do such and such math problem? If the teacher asked, I wanted to raise my hand for every one. In order to do that, I'd stay up until 12 o'clock usually after I'd done all of my other schoolwork, doing all the math problems. And if the problems were particularly difficult, I would stay up till two or three o'clock in the morning because I wanted to do all of the problems, the star problems, the double star problems. And even though partial credit was never going to work for me in that school, you can't argue with a, an answer that's 100% correct. As a result of that, I was selected to be the captain of the junior math team when I was a sophomore, and I was selected to be the captain of the senior math team when I was a junior, wow. high school. And that wasn't because people gave me equity points, and we could get to that later. After high school, I, I did fairly well on standardized tests, even though we didn't prepare for them. I didn't know how to prepare for a standardized test. We just mastered the material. I went to college. My first two years were in the company of the wrong company, and my grades suffered for it. But I changed schools because someone rescued me out of the bad one. And my first year as a physics student, after my first year as a physics student, I was selected to an MIT Lincoln Lab work-study program. And I, I worked in a group that had just launched two communication satellites, LESS 8 and 9. Little did I know that years later, when I was in the military, working at the Pentagon, that I would be the action officer to coordinate and assist in decommissioning those two satellites some 20 some years after they had been launched and I was there after they had just been launched. But before the military, I also 
in college had an opportunity to receive, what do you mean receive? I competed for a scholarship to study at a prestigious uh, European university, l'Université Paul Valéry in Montpellier, France. And I wasn't a French student, I was a physics student, but the opportunity came up and I thought, I can do that. And I worked very hard and with the help of others, but working very hard, I did go to that prestigious university, one of the 10 medieval universities in Europe, and I uh, had a wonderful time. I took Japanese as my second language to the French, and uh, came back and changed my major to math instead of physics, and uh, joined the Navy. They made me an offer to, to be one of their, part of their brain trust. And uh, after that, I met Jeff at MIT Lincoln Lab, you know, I, long before. We were married. <clears throat> we had a little girl. Our marriage failed. But somehow over the years, we got back together. And um, it, that's been a lot of the surface of what made me what I am today. Coming up in my family, you have to understand, Tao, that education was everything. It was worth the investment in the young people. It was worth more than having the best or the most popular wardrobe or having long, you know, Christmas tree fingernails or any of those other surface things that won't take you anywhere. And to this very day, that's still very important to me. And I try to instill in as many young people as I can along the way that investing in their own personal education is the most important thing. And even if they're not so young, even if they're a bit older, it's never too late to be responsible for your own education. The, the United Negro College Fund used to have a saying, a mind is a terrible thing to waste. And I would say that even today, a mind is a terrible thing to waste whoever you are. A young kid in high school or even elementary school, it's never too late to lasso in your opportunity to get a good education. I had opportunity when I was going through school and no, nobody paid for my school. I work studied, researched, and tutored a teacher assistant through my high school, my, my, my university studies. Why am I running? So you ask, why am I here? Somebody, some bodies, asked me to consider running for the Vermont State Senate. I don't have anything to gain personally from being a senator. But I tell you what, I am not afraid, embarrassed, or ashamed to speak the things that I believe are true and to work for the betterment of our wonderful state of Vermont. Vermont is worth working for. Vermont used to be on the map internationally in the machine tool uh, industry. Worldwide, Vermont, Springfield, Vermont, this used to be world known, renowned. And I believe that it's in the DNA of Vermont to have that kind of greatness. I see that people are looking for people to, of course, everybody has their challenges. I know you had yours. I've had mine. We all have our challenges. We don't want somebody to give us a handout. We want them to give us a hand so that we can do for ourselves. And unfortunately, there are a lot of people who are looking for our government to be a nanny state for us. If I were to bring anything to the table and why I decided to run for the Senate is because I believe that if enough people understood that yes, we have our challenges, individually and collectively, we have challenges right now in the state of Vermont, in fact, throughout the United States, in fact, all around the world. But here in Vermont, 
we have our problems. And I don't want people telling us that they have to be responsible to give us our next slice of bread, our next place to stay. Why don't we try to see if we can help each other overcome the hurdles so that we can all have a vision of what we can do, that we can all contribute to the social order. Why am I running for Senate for the, in uh, Windsor County? It's because I would like to at least represent a voice. I want to be a voice for that spirit of independence the spirit that if you look back over the historical documents for the state of Vermont, that spirit is there. There are people who want to cover that over and make us forget. But our great grandparents and people before fought too hard and worked too hard for us to come to success, for us just to give it up. I think a lot of our young people so why am I running? I think a lot of our young people have lost a vision for what they themselves can do. A lot of older people have lost a vision of how they are a critical link between the past and the future to make that happen. We're all just trying to get by. We've got to get past the idea of just getting by if it means eating sardine sandwiches, come on, people. You can do it. We can all buckle down and we can have success. Are there specific things that, as a state senator, you would like to see Vermont do, bills, laws, that could help fix some of these problems, regardless of what's happening in Washington? Well, that's a very interesting point that you bring up. And I had mentioned that I think that we've been hoodwinked into believing that we're tied into being part of the nanny state. We are one of the 50 states of the United States. The national government, the founders of our country and our constitution set up a form of government for ourselves where it really does flow from what the states do up to the, the national level and not the national level telling us all what we need to do. This is why you see certain states that say they will do such and such a thing or they won't do such and such a thing. And it's dependent on the states to make certain that those things do or don't happen. That is, it's us. It's us, not some big daddy in the sky or mama in the sky. If there were certain things, now there are a lot of problems that are actually going on that are beyond us being able to do it on our own right now. But all these uh, social programs didn't really come about until relatively recently, in the last 50, 60 years. We can work ourselves out of that. Are there specific social programs that you'd like to either cut or reform? One of the ones that I think has done the greatest amount of damage uh, started with Lyndon Baines Johnson and his war on poverty. If you know how many thousands of billions, trillions of dollars have been fought, this war on poverty, uh, everybody is in a worse situation now because of it. It fed the bureaucratic machinery. There are some things that uh, we could do to make, um, to make our state um, more self-sufficient. I remember one area in particular, the Housing and, housing and Urban Development, uh, HUD, uh, had a particular program that was employed in New Orleans when I was a little girl. Really, my father was, was working for HUD. He, was, he did a lot of things, but he was also able, very capable at administering uh, buildings. Building, uh, not buildings, but building. And they engineered a program where instead of people living in 
the projects, which were state-owned uh, housing units, they had opportunity to own their own home, own their own, their own homes. So impactful was that program that after Hurricane Katrina wiped everything out, when they looked at the data in New Orleans, in that area, nearly 50% of the people in that area were homeowners. Being a homeowner or a condominium owner puts a person in a, in a different mindset than if you're just living in a subsidized home or something that the government is making available to you. And there's pride of ownership, and you keep things in a different way than if you don't own them. Uh, if I don't have the solution to housing, but I think that it's a very big problem here in the state of Vermont, statewide, if there is a solution that comes to the table, I would like to make certain that there is some aspect of it that would include the option for home ownership, that general term. That is part of lifting us up so that we could have personal dignity, pride of ownership, and make the community a better place for all of us. So that's one thing that I, can I change every, I'm not going to pretend that I can change anything. I'm just interested in making certain that if there are things that could make sense for our state that we at least consider doing them. Another thing that I would like to make certain of that I've seen uh, relates to education. Am I an educator? We are all educators. We are all responsible for one another to put our thumbprint on somebody else and make our culture a better place for all of us. But I do not particularly care for the inclination that our culture is going in now. When you look at the standardized test scores, which is all that really, at the bottom line, how well are we doing in academics is all that we should really be concerned with well, primarily should, we should be concerned with in our school system. And yet in our government school system, COVID, is not, COVID was not a cover. The standardized test scores were already dropping before the crisis. COVID only made it worse. And, and I'm sorry for all that happened, but when you look at the solutions that they put in place to address uh, education, I know it's not going to appeal to everybody, but I think that the majority of our education ought to be about reading, writing, and arithmetic. Sciences and things that make us people of worth to some part of the machinery. I could care less what your, the color of your skin is. I could care less what your family's origin uh, culture uh, or culture is. I really don't want to be in your bedroom. Don't make me be there and you're not welcome to mine. So as far as sexualizing our young people, what has that got to do with making our, cult our, our kids better students? Our schools need to be about reading, writing, arithmetic, science, maybe civics, other things. Maybe civics. Well, I'm just saying. Yeah. What about the arts? That too. Can I tell you? What about the arts? Do you know? What about general international literature? When I was in high school, and uh, uh, no, let's go back to the arts. I, I had mentioned to you offline that my mother, who was adopted, was a portrait artist, a realist, a portrait artist, and she was a poet. And I don't have copies of her poetry, but I would love to share them and publish them uh, uh, posthumously for her. Uh, they're fabulous. 
But my mother and my father and my teachers introduced me to art, like Gauguin or Picasso, which is really off on the other end, <laughs> I don't know, or Gaudi or any of the uh, you know, any of these wonderful artists. I remember studying in France. I studied art appreciation. Beautiful, Marc Chagall. What about literature? I, st I, was, I thought I was fluent in Spanish when I was a little girl, a young girl in high school. I had Spanish friends. So I told you French, but I didn't tell you Spanish. But you know, in order to be a physics student, I had to take German. So French wasn't what I did, and Spanish, even though I could speak it, wasn't what I did. I read textbook German because I was a physics student. And I think I mentioned, or did I, that when I was in France, I took Japanese as my second language. How can our kids accurately, adequately communicate in the plus que parfait in French if they don't understand the pluperfect tense in English. And when are they going to learn it? During the, I'm not saying that there's something wrong with gay pride, but it has nothing to do with what we have on the table today. We are in crisis in our schools. Our I was learning the rudiments of diagramming sentences when I was in first grade in a government school. These kids, my mother was a first grade teacher in the government school. Her first grade students, and I know it because at her funeral, one of her students who was uh, a sportscaster and newscaster in New Orleans spoke and he said, Mrs. Randall taught us in first grade Dr. Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. This is a lovely set of vocabulary words that people should embrace in that speech. But how can you do it if you're covering it over with 60% of it on this gay stuff that has nothing to do with preparing kids to be internationally competitive? This is what we have today. We are in crisis. Do you think there's a concerted effort, an organized effort from the top that's being taught in schools to indoctrinate kids. Definitely. And, and in fact, if you speak out against it, you're marginalized and in some cases, uh, you might even be arrested because of your, quote, violent speech. Oh, please, people, we're talking about our schools, our elementary schools, our middle schools, our high schools. And I want to say it for the record. You know that man... Uh, what's his name, Kaepernick, mm -hmm. years ago, I had already, I voiced this. I, I did not agree that our school classes should have his face all over the side of the, so he was a quarterback. But you know what? He was adopted by a, a, a pale face, can I say white? Uh, he was adopted by a white family. His mother, he was interracial. And he had a girlfriend who radicalized him. And I'm not saying that black lives don't matter, but she radicalized, his girlfriend radicalized him to Black Lives Matter, and I'm not a proponent of Black Lives Matter. I believe all lives matter. And I don't want anybody to have to bow to anyone else. But it's not just Black Lives Matter or the, the LGBT, all the rest of the letters that go with that or any of those, those things, it's Black Lives Matter is a farce. But the schools are pressing. In fact, I've spoken to, in Zoom conferences, to certain schools, uh, board meetings, that ought to not be forced on the schools. Why would the, why? Unless you're racist. Would you want to emphasize race? It has nothing to do, or should have nothing to do, with the academic expectations for each student. Do you think that the, the, the history 
the history in America with regard to race is important to teach? Uh, now that's another, that's a very interesting question, Tail, because I want everybody, I know I've said this before, but I want everybody to think, and I know if I say it twice, you'll remember it. The year is 1830. 1830 was a census year here in the United States. The 1830 census that was Snopes verified clearly shows that, and it was Snopes verified. It is, they, you can try to erase it, but the internet is forever, and it shows that there were thousands, thousands of people of color who owned slaves in America. And these, peop, these thousands of slave owners owned many, many thousands of slaves. Some, maybe onesies, twosies, their, fam, their wife, their, their children, I don't know. But there were some who owned tens, scores, a hundred even, or more, uh, across the United States, even in the state of Mississippi. I, I didn't know that until I went back and looked at the data. Mississippi was not so, <laughs> didn't have so many, but it did have some. And I want you to know that a lot of people believe that this, this story, Roots, attributed to Alex Haley, shows how the culture was here in the United States. And I want you to know that that is incongruent with a, a picture where you have thousands of people of color who are openly owning slaves. And by the way, most white people in America did not own slaves. Look at the data. But you're not saying that more black people own slaves. No, than I'm white not. People. Some black people, they're not saying most. I'm saying it was a very small percentage of population. But there were only thousands, not tens or hundreds of thousands. There were thousands, though, of, of people who did. And they owned them openly. So it, the culture had to somehow accommodate that. And there were people who had. Furniture making in North Carolina, very well known uh, people all across the United States who did uh, live in a different way. I asked my own father after I saw Roots, I said, tell me about our slave heritage. And he said, <clears throat> we don't have a slave heritage. Rather than submit to slavery, our people ran off to live with the Native Americans, which is how, and in fact, it wasn't that unusual. Most uh, Native American tribes in the United States do have some uh, African back in their, in their bloodlines, and that's how it happened. Now, what happened to the Native Americans is another story, and I won't go into that, but what I would say is this, to get back to your question, I do not believe that the differences of race have been as pronounced as popular culture would have you believe it was. I believe, for ex and even today, you would think after 50, 60 years since Dr. Martin Luther King that the culture back then was a lot worse than it is today that we've progressed, and I'll tell you, it's not. When the great society came and people were encouraged to have children out of wedlock, in fact, paid more if you had more kids, don't have a man in the house, that did a lot to break up a lot of family units. And, um, and, we, didn't, and, and we lost a lot of ground. We're seeing the same thing happen to our culture here in Vermont. Where, where people are becoming accustomed to, being, to having the government as the, quote, father figure in the house. And the man's role in the, how, in the home has been marginalized. How so in Vermont has the man's role been marginalized? Well, look at how our young people, look, I'm, I'm gonna just be honest with you. I don't think that we would have such a terrible fentanyl problem in the state of Vermont if there was a lot more stability in the home. I'm just being honest, no lie. Do you think economic stability plays into that too? Even if there's stability in the home, if there's not economic stability, well, you know, people can fall into that. Tao, let's get back to, let's get, let's get down to where the rubber meets the road. I told you, 
I sometimes had sardine sandwiches. Now, that'd be a little expensive today, but it doesn't matter. It, economic stability, the poverty, quote, poverty in the United States, I'm not saying it's not real. It is real. But compared to poverty around the world, there's no comparison. It's all a matter of expectations. And people put themselves in front of the television or on the YouTube or whatever they look at, and they get programmed into thinking what their lives, their lives ought to be, and they get off the track. Let's get back to some basic things, and we'll see. You, I bet you we could see that we could do a whole lot better with a whole lot less. I'm not saying make us all impoverished, although the society, that, the, cult, the state that we're going into now with the financial crisis that's about to crash, is about to happen to us, may plummet us into it. But I think that we, we don't, it doesn't have to be the brink of despair. We can pick ourselves up and say, okay, we don't have all of these things. We can't go to McDonald's so many times. And by the way, McDonald's, $5, $6, $10, I don't know how much it costs to feed your family there. But I bet you we could find something simpler to eat and be thankful for and be happy with. And even if you want to be more fancy, for example, can I give you a little fancy? Okay. I like kombucha. Mm -hmm. But boy, that stuff in the little bottles costs about, what, 4 or $5 yeah. each? You can make kombucha from black tea. And the, and, the, and the yeast, if you have a SCOBY. And you can make a whole gallon of kombucha from water that doesn't cost so much. And four to eight tea bags, which don't cost so much either, and have a goodly, and a, and a bit of sugar. You can make a lot of things from scratch, is what I'm saying. So we can go to another level and I'd be very happy to encourage, maybe I'll get on, get a YouTube channel and show people how you can live quite well with a lot of wonderful things um, that'll be healthier. And certainly, as far as feeding the mind, there's a lot that we can do for, to encourage each other. I can give you an example, one little example. We're fortunate in the state of Vermont, at least I am in White River Junction in that area, to have a place called the Listen Center. I think it's an opportunity for people who have things that are gently used or new to donate those things that the community, including books, uh, that someone else who is uh, interested in saving can go and, and acquire things there. I went there and I found a, a volume of Guy de Maupassant stories in English. And oh, I'm so, I was so happy to find it. We can do a lot of things. And how much did the Guy de Maupassant book cost? It didn't cost me $100, it didn't cost me $50, it cost me a couple of dollars, and, and I am happy again. There are a lot of, and so with books, we can help each other by recycling our books. We can show each other how to garden or raise animals. Quail are not that hard to raise, and uh, our goats. We can teach each other how to get back to our roots here in Vermont, and we can do just fine we can do just fine. I'm not saying that it's not going to be hard, but there's a lot that we can do. So as a, as a Republican running in a district that has been, where, where the seats have been held by Democrats for a long time, how, how are you trying to persuade voters to vote for you? What's your, what's your pitch and how do you present your platform to people? My general pitch is that when you look at me, okay, and I've been honest to say it, that I would have no hope in a, Democrat, in a Democrat organization. 
because they're, it's lost, they, they want one way of thinking. The Republicans were a little bit more lenient. So maybe there are some things about her that are a little rough on the edges, and she doesn't quite fit into exactly what our mold is. But we're, they, they let me speak what I want to say, and I don't think I'd have any hope as an independent. The things that I am interested in are not along party lines. Teo, we're talking about our survival. We're talking about our future. The most important thing to me, the number one issue for our future, even though having a house and the price of food and all of that is very important, we're going to fix those things. Nobody's going to let anybody starve here in Vermont. But one thing we have to fix is how we're bringing up the next generation. We have to help them realize that there's a hope and a future for them. And even showing their parents how that hope and future is also in their hands. They, are, they have to play a part in this happening. You can't uh, delegate it to the teachers. Who knows what they have in their brain? They don't love your children as much as you do. So as, as a lawmaker, how do you accomplish that? I make certain that the laws that are put in place do not get in the way of the voice of the parents. And unfortunately, I've seen, because I've had to speak to so many of these people over this COVID crisis, over the last two years, I've spoken to a couple of, on a couple of Zoom talks. I'm appalled, I honestly am, that some of these school board people sit there in their semicircle and feel as if they're demagogues. And their word is law, religion. And there is no listening to the voice of the parents. I don't live in Montpellier. In Montpel I'm sorry, they don't pronounce it Montpellier. Montpellier. I don't live in Montpellier. I don't live in Orange County. I don't live in a lot of other places, but I live here in the state of Vermont and can't, and if somebody in that school district wants to at least have me come and speak, shouldn't, uh, to represent them, shouldn't my voice be heard as well? But they don't want to hear that. I remember, and, and make, what, law? I remember in front of uh, the state capitol, the state capitol, there was a, dis when they were just putting Black Lives Matter on the street in front of the state capitol, that is a statement concerning all Vermonters. I wanted to have somewhere, maybe not on top of it, maybe to the side of it, somewhere, liberty and justice for all. Now you can't have that. That, if it's not de jour, it's de facto law. And my voice, and not just my voice, but a lot of voices were overshadowed and not represented. Am I trying to be a radical? No. To say that liberty and justice for all, Black Lives Matter, by the way, that con coolers or whoever she is, she owns a number of properties, some of them in more than a million dollars or a few million dollars, one of the, and has airplane hangers. Well, so as if you're elected as a legislator, would you be there just to vote up or down, or would you be proposing specific pieces of legislation? Depending what's on the floor, I might be proposing a number of things. One thing that I'm very interested in, we in Vermont, you know, Vermont is a uh, constitutional carry state, as far as arms are concerned. If you look over the arena, the whole picture of the United States, those cities that have the most restrictive gun ownership legislation on their books are 100 percent, and I'm a mathematician, you show me otherwise, 
100% the very cities that are having the highest crime problems in the United States. And they want to, quote, defund the police. I grew up calling the policeman or that person in uniform or officer friendly. They were there to help us. We could call them up. And if we had a problem and they could get to us, they would come out and help us, regardless of color, or even regardless of the neighborhood. There are some places in the United States where the policemen are ambushed and taken down. And their assailants may not even get to serve any time for having killed them. Think about that. A man who gave his, or woman, who gave their full life in training through school and, and, and in pride, representing and helping our, our, their community to have been gunned down worse than a dog. I am, I am, I'm, I back the blue. These men and women, when they go out the door in the morning, they don't know whether they're going to come back the night, the next night, that night. And you can say, well, they got paid. Well, that's a very cavalier attitude. Somebody's putting their life on the line to help you. The same for the firemen. The same for any of our, 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 our serve, people who serve us. We should thank them and say that we appreciate what they've done. Instead, we, instead, we support by putting it big block letters in front of our state capital, Black Lives Matter, when you know that it is a communist-based organization, and when you know that the people whose community, the peoples whose communities are being upended are not benefiting from that, I would not like to see, and, and a lot of people like to live in that. Let me go one more time on the Second Amendment because I'm very much a supporter of all of our Constitution. I think it was a very good document. I carry it with me. Um, I don't want to see Vermont go the way of Chicago, Minneapolis, New York, or any of their other, or Portland, or any of their other poster uh, communities. We're not, we're not there, and I don't want us to go there. My having the right to constitutionally carry, I don't, I'm not carrying anything. But you, certainly in my home, you step into my door, unwelcomed in the middle of the night, and my grandchild is there, you have to ex assume that if I have a fuzzy slipper on, I will do what it takes to defend my grandchild, even with a fuzzy slipper, if that's what I have. But so don't come in threatening uh, my family. And I don't mean to be negative, but if it's my home, I have a right to defend myself. In the state of Vermont, to be honest, I have a right to defend myself there too. I didn't mention that I had taken karate. I'm not going to be your victim. You probably ought to go find somebody else to play with first. Do, do you think gun rights in Vermont are, are under threat? Oh, yes. Yes, they are. In, in what way? Well, <clears throat> there are people who I've, I've, I've read and I've heard of, quote, they, they put language on it like assault weapons. What? <laughs> assault weapons? Well, there's no, there's no talk about banning assault weapons, whatever those are, in Vermont. But they would certainly like to limit my ability to have whichever weapon of choice that I, that I, can, legally, uh, that I can legally own. I haven't heard of it. So I'm a gun owner, and I've been paying attention to what they're doing in Montpelier, and I don't have any fears that they're going to take my guns away. Okay, I hope not. Um, I'm not going to, I don't think anybody needs to know uh, what I have, but I do have a fuzzy slipper. It's a soft, flexible thing. And you come into my house and I'll be ready to fix, fix you up. Don't touch my grandchildren. 
Well, I think, I mean, I, I feel like Vermont, we do have very, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say liberal, we have liberal gun laws in that we, we, we give people uh, a lot of freedom to and I hope And I hope to, to, to retain that freedom, although I do know that there are people who would like to take those rights away. Getting back to education, I want to talk about education funding. Do you think that education in Vermont is adequately funded? Are teachers paid well enough? Uh, are there any ways that we could reform our education funding? Because we can't have quality education without money. So who's going to pay for it? Well, that's very interesting because if uh, for the last 30, now 40 years, uh, the in science magazines and in international rags that look in the science community, if you look at the ranking of the nations, of, of all the, of the major nations. If you asked the students or you asked a, an American, where did you think the United States fell in ranking uh, compared to other nations? And most people thought back then that the United States was definitely had to be one or two or somewhere up there, whereas the reality is that the scores show that uh, proficiency in math and science is just right behind, is very, very poor. We are behind Spain. We're behind, definitely behind uh, Russia. We're behind a lot of people who spend a lot less money per capita and get a lot more results. Going back to uh, funding, because I can't shake money out of pockets that are empty. I think we're spending a good, um, I know it's going to be unpopular, but I'm, going to, I'm a grandmother and I'm going to tell you the unpopular thing. I think we may be spending money on the wrong things. Like in the military, you put everything on the table and you see what it is and then you let the chips fall where they may. You prioritize based on the payback from the things you're paying for. I don't think that we need to sexualize our kids. That's low on my list. In fact, it's not on the list of anything at all. Uh, it's covered under the Constitution where you don't discriminate against a person because of race, religion, creed, sex, or national origin, or, you know, sexual identification, or whatever, they, all those things. We are, that's already the law. You don't have to teach it two hours of an eight-hour day. Is that happening? Oh, yes. And what are they, how are they teaching it? There, if you look at the funding of the books that are in the libraries, if you look, oh, you know what? The Zoom lectures were able to show, the Zoom lectures showed just what is being discussed in the classes. And how, pray, can you begin to talk to a kid about uh, transitioning? That's a permanent, that's a permanent move when they're in a point in their life when they haven't really decided on a whole lot of things. Are you going to give them a double mastectomy or, or, or alter them in other ways uh, permanently? Um, why? Why don't you just let kids be kids? And I bet that there is a lot of money. I, uh, let's put it this way. Given the press that I've seen, I wouldn't be surprised. And the discussions that I've had to engage in and endure, I would not be surprised if there's more than, an, uh, if there is a significant amount of money that is being put to things that are not as at or should not be as at are not at as high a priority fiscally as they are currently listed. But isn't that the job of the school boards? We well, see that's the problem. The the student the parents the 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 citizens ought to be there to speak what they want to the school boards. I've, I've seen school boards that are just make you faint almost. I, no, they wouldn't make me faint. I become almost indignant when I think, you mean this person is going to tell 
these parents what's best for their kids when I bet if I ask them how many of you have children who are enduring the education that you're foisting upon the people at that school, you know. How many of you, many of these people have kids in private schools, yet they're on the school boards and giving this trash for our kids to, to uh, be exposed to. And it's not insignificant. Uh, critical race theory, what, where is that? What, why are you doing critical race, what? That's something that was made up 20, 30 years ago. Is that I, being required in Windsor County? I'd have to go look. But I do know that it's, it's um, it, it, in some places it has been there. I want to make certain that these kinds of things get as much of a broad, um, if they come up. I'm not, I don't have to make anything up. Too many things to deal with. But if they do come up, I certainly want to make certain that there is a voice. But do, do you think that the state should take over control of education and, and do away with school boards that are democratically no. elected? No, no. Because if, if, if education think, is a problem, aren't the, the parents are ultimately electing the school board members. The parents are ultimately electing the school board members, but when the parents say we have a problem, there ought to be some support from up on top to make certain that these individual school boards are in, are, are in line with what the executor says the school board ought to be focused on. Do you think that the state should just set like minimum standards? Yes. And give, give school boards like guardrails? Um, now that's a, now you say <laughs> minimum standards. Like Those don't do this. Minimum, I do not want anybody to tell me about critical race theory. I don't think any of them are qualified, and I don't believe in it. And I believe if people really understood what critical race theory led them to, they wouldn't want it either. And I certainly don't think it has any place in a math class. Um, but that's the discussion nationwide going on right now. And um, we, we should have some minimal standards that relate to academics. Can we agree? I can see. I can agree to that. Relate strictly to academics, and then, if the teachers, if the parents have difficulty, there ought to be a means of pre presenting it to the uh, to the principal, and then if that fails, then you bring it up to the school board, and then if that gives no satisfaction, you bring it to another level. So you're running for Senate in Windsor County. This is going to this is on Woodstock Community Television. What's your pitch to Woodstock voters? Why should they vote for you over the incumbents and the other folks yeah. in the race? Elevator pitch. Elevator pitch. I am a grandparent. I am a parent. I am a Vermonter. I love the state. I want to make certain that the populace here in Windsor County and Vermont in general appreciate the value that has been bestowed upon us by those who came before us. We have to all of us do our part and I'm putting myself forward to help make that voice heard in Montpelier. Any final words for the, for the citizens of, of Woodstock and Windsor County? I do. I have one word. Become involved. And it doesn't matter what your political affiliation is. Do what you believe is right in your heart. I would encourage you not to first consider party affiliations. Do what you believe is right for your community and your family. That means vote. And if it means going across the aisle and, and voting for this Republican, okay, she's a, you think she's a Republican. Yeah, she's a Vermonter first. Or if it means voting for whomever, go out there and exercise your civil 
liberty, your civil responsibility. That's it. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Thank you for having me.